Uh, yeah, so good morning, everybody. Thanks for being here. Um, so yeah, my name is Soren. I'm a second year master's student here at the Douglas, and I'll be moderating the talk today. Um, yeah, it's a great pleasure to introduce Dr. Karim Gerbi, who will be giving our Douglas uh, Imaging Center lecture this morning. Um, so Dr. Gerbi is a professor at the psychology department at the Université de Montréal. He's the Canada Research Chair in Computational Neuroscience and Cognitive Neuroimaging, and he heads UNIQUE, the Quebec Neuro AI Research Center. He is a member of the Royal Society of Canada's College of New Scholars, Artists and Scientists, and he obtained his PhD in Cognitive Neuroscience and Brain Imaging from Pierre and Marie Curie University in Paris, and a Biomedical Engineering degree from University's University of Karlsruhe in Germany. His research lies at the crossroads of co cognitive, computational, and clinical neuroscience, and his goal is to elucidate the role of neural oscillations and large-scale neural communication in cognition, as well as to investigate brain network alterations in psychiatric and neurological disorders. So we're very excited to welcome here today uh, to talk about brain oscillations in healthy and diseased states, and to reassure us that hypothesis-driven and data-driven methods are both cool. Um, so yeah, as, as Malar said, uh, if you have questions, you can either uh, post them in the chat and I can read them out, or you can raise your hand. So I'll be I'll be watching hands and things like that, and I can um, I can interrupt if if there are burning burning questions. Um, and then there will also be some time for questions at the end as well. Okay, thank you so much uh, for this uh, for this invitation. So I'd like to first start off by acknowledging that the uh, the land on which we gather is the traditional and unceded territory of the Kenya and Kihaka, a place which has long served as a site of meeting and exchange amongst nations. Um, I'm very grateful to the invitation by the Douglas uh, Research Center for this talk. I've been, I had the chance to come out and give a talk many, uh, several years ago. Um, so I'm happy to be back. And uh, I recall also having a lot of exciting discussions with the students after the talk uh, at the time. So I, I hope we'll also have the opportunity to engage uh, in discussions afterwards. Um, so very briefly, the, the, the COCO lab, which is the name of my, my lab at the University of Montreal, stands for Computational and Cognitive Neuroscience Lab. And basically what we do um, schematically is we use a number of brain imaging techniques. Um, I'll come to those um, in more detail later on. Um, behavioral measures um, and a large array of signal processing techniques. Um, in combination with uh, tools from AI, in particular machine learning. Um, and then we apply those to a number of wide range of questions, uh, ranging from cognitive processes that um, underlie consciousness, um, that um, play a role in sleep, uh, dreams, episodic memory, decision making, and sustained attention. And recently, we have also been exploring uh, creativity, um, and we have a number of studies on psychiatric disorders. So I will, to reassure you, I won't be talking about all of this. I'll choose a couple of studies, um, but I'll be happy to discuss uh, some of the other research. So uh, this is the amazing team um, of, of scientists uh, and early career researchers and students that um, are um, with the, um, in the COCO Lab. So I'm um, very lucky to have um, all these people working on these projects. Uh, and caters for a very nice uh, research environment, uh, very creative. And uh, this is actually really what keeps me going. And this is the reason I think I do science is to be working with these people. Um, so the research that I'll be telling you about today um, will focus on work by some of these students, not all of them. Uh, Tarek Lejnev, um, uh, Golnou Shalamian, Aniruda Kemtour, um, Arthur Degan, Annalisa Pascarella, and uh, Thomas Thierry uh, primarily. So um, first of all, let's before we go into the oscillations and the, the studies in, in health and disease, I'd like to touch on the, 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 uh, the subtitle that I gave to, to my title, which is uh, focusing on uh, data-driven versus hypothesis-driven um, research. Um, so th there seems to be, um, over the last couple of years, some, some confusing and some questions going on about this question of, should we be dropping hypothesis-driven research now that we have all these fancy tools that allow us to do data mining. Um, and, and the question rises as well, you know, even hypothesis-driven research basically relies on data and uh, probably also data-driven approaches maybe incorporate also some hypothesis. So there seems to be a little bit of confusion. And the reason this is, in my opinion, is that we've moved on from um, ice age to an age today where um, we call this the age of AI or machine learning or big data as you like, uh, but where essentially we have now um, a lot of um, information and data that is available to us. The computational power has increased dramatically and this has given rise to the uh, what we could, would like to call a renaissance of AI. 
um, and the flourishing of the, the of the loosely defined domain we call data science. Um, what this means is that now, um, before people or colleagues or or um, or your supervisor would be asking you what's what is your research question, and now it seems like our question is automatically people seem to ask you nowadays, are you doing this with machine learning? As if that's basically the only way to do things. Uh, so I think this is this is an important question and we need to ponder upon this and understand whether we should all be rushing towards machine learning as the default approach or uh, whether the question is a bit more complex. So is hypothesis driven research over? That's uh, the underlying question. And I suggest we come back to this afterwards after I've given you a, um, more information uh, regarding some of the studies that we're looking at to, to tackle this from, from different angles. So something many of you might be uh, already familiar with is the, you know, these two families of approaches when we're looking into uh, analyzing uh, data, in particular in neuroimaging or neuroscience. Um, there is what we call in-sample versus out-of-sample uh, approaches. So for in-sample approaches, these would be classical statistics, using classical hypothesis testing and classical statistical inference. Um, and in the family of out-of-sample techniques, um, we'll be using statistical learning or pattern, uh, pattern learning algorithms uh, and um, trying to achieve out-of-sample generalization. So on the left-hand side, what we're doing is we're seeking to reject a null hypothesis by considering the entirety of all the data that we have, uh, simply put. On the right-hand side, however, what we seek to do is to extrapolate the learned model and apply it to data not used for model training and seeing how well it generalizes. And that's why we call this out of sample generalization. And there seems to be sort of a fight between these two and some people are going for saying, well, we don't need machine learning. We have all we need with the classical tools. Others go for out of sample generalization. Um, and if you can guess what video, what music video this, um, this snippet has taken, they will reveal a lot about your age. Um, so I'm not assuming many people will find this, but um, as this is not really 100% interactive, I mean, you can feel free to put in in the chat if you have guessed the um, the video uh, that I'm using here. I'm going to give you the answer in five seconds. So the answer is New Order, True Faith, and this is uh, it's actually quite a quite a nice tune, 1987. Um, so on the left-hand side, again, inferential statistics. That's, for example, typically what you do when you're using correlations, like Pearson or Spearman correlation. Uh, you're comparing means with t-tests and ANOVA, you're using regression analysis, and you're using non-parametric approaches, such as Wilcoxon and permutation tests. Um, on the right-hand side, out of sample generalization, that's typically what you do with machine learning, because you're trying to learn from the data a model that we, you would then apply uh, to new data and try to generalize. So just to give a quick background, I'd like to go through this very briefly because sometimes there's some confusion in terminology and nomenclature for people that are new to the field of, of machine learning in, in particular. Um, the larger term or concept is artificial intelligence, which kicked off in the 50s, uh, trying to mimic uh, biological human uh, intelligence. Within this field, there's a subfield, which we refer to as machine learning, which is typically what happens with your um, Gmail or your mailbox where it automatically detects what is spam and what isn't. It's based on a model that has learned and applies that to incoming mails and decides you know, emails and decides whether they're spam or not. That's a typical example of a machine learning uh, classification approach. Within machine learning, there are many approaches possible. One of them is deep learning. So this is just basically to give a quick overview of how these things relate to one another. Um, because you, deep learning is obviously something we hear a lot about these days. Uh, specifically also in Montreal. So, so it's important to just um, understand the relationship between these three um, broad concepts. So because I talked about out of sample generalization, um, what I propose to do here is uh, to explain a, a concept that is closely related to machine learning uh, and out of sample generalization, which is supervised learning. I'm gonna try to do this in 143 seconds. So basically, imagine you're collecting brain data. This can be fMRI data, it can be EEG or MEG. So you have, assuming in your, in your task, uh, the uh, individual oscillates between two states, maybe a um, attentive state and maybe a more distracted state, anyway, a state A and a state B. You collect the brain signals, you uh, extract features from those signals, and then you train a classifier to predict whether the individual is uh, in state A or in state B. This is typically what we do refer to as a binary classifier. 
Now, how does this actually work? The learning process is actually can actually be formalized as a process by which you're choosing to fine tune the rules and parameters of a decision function f. So what the model is trying to do when it's training, uh, when it's been trained, is to um, identify a decision function that best classifies the training data. And then it's going to apply that to uh, unseen data and see how well it generalizes. So typically, if you have two uh, conditions or two cognitive states, or maybe um, two populations, controls versus patients, if you look at the data, if you spread the data in two dimensions here by looking at two features of the data, these just going to be two representations of your, of your signals. Then if you see the yellow and the blue dots here, um, basically learning to uh, identify a decision function basically is an algorithm trying to identify this straight line here that, according to the algorithm, um, linearly uh, discriminates these two, um, these two groups. And then when a new data point comes in, this is the red spot here, based on the fact that the algorithm now has learned that decision function from the blue and the yellow dots. Now, obviously, you can tell what it's going to predict. It's going to try to predict whether that red dot is blue or yellow, and it's going to classify it as blue. This is typically uh, out of sample generalization, and I just wanted to make sure that the concept is, is clear to everyone, and feel free to, uh, to ask any questions related to this. Obviously, there are many algorithms that you can use, and you can experiment, and hyperparameters that you can fine tune for this. Technically, you train your algorithm on part of the data, which we call the training set, and then you test uh, on the test set. So as I said, there are many classifiers that you can use. Um, you have a training phase and a test phase. And then what you do is you apply your model that has been trained on the training set to the test set. And on, in the orange part here at the bottom, you look at the performance. How well does it perform on data that it has never seen before? That's, again, out of sample generalization. This can obviously depend a lot on how you um, you um, split your data into training and, and test. So to avoid any biases, what you would do, you would do that over and over again. That's a process uh, you're probably familiar with called cross-validation. So you repeat that um, many times, and then you look at the average performance of your algorithm. Now, um, if you're interested in this debate between the use of classical statistics and statistical learning approaches in imaging neuroscience, I can recommend the, uh, the, the, the nice paper by Danilo Bzdok, um, who's also now a researcher in, in Montreal at McGill. Um, and, and basically, um, this tells us that, that these approaches are complementary and they're conceptually different. Uh, in one case, you're looking at uh, falsifying hypotheses. And in the other case, you're looking at um, using out of sample generalization um, and extrapolating um, um, to um, your model to independent uh, data. Uh, this is just a, a, an image from, from that article, and I encourage you to, to look at it. What's important here at the bottom, if you can see those question marks, compared to classical statistics, where you assume a model, and the question mark here, you're actually deriving the model by training your uh, model on the data. So it's, that's why we refer to this also as data-driven, because your model is trained on the data, and then you look at how well it generalizes um, to unseen data. A related study that could be of interest is uh, one published by Talia Arconi and Jacob Westfall um, a few years ago. And the idea is that the observed effects in the brain that you see with a statistically significant p-value does not necessarily mean that it generalizes to future brain recordings. And this could be a problem because most of the studies that we do, um, at the end of your article, you'll be saying, well, we've, uh, we think that based on our sample of 30 or 40 or more subjects, we think that this is what's happened, what happens in the brain of human beings in general. So we make that implicit generalization, but we've never really tested that because we have focused on those 30 specific or 40 specific individuals. Um, but also, conversely, it's important to, um, to also um, realize that um, an effect that is successfully captured by a learning algorithm, like using machine learning and out of sample generalization, does not imply necessarily also that you get a significant p-value if you submitted this to a null hypothesis testing. Um, this is why I'm just saying, again, these are com complementary and conceptually different approaches. And I think we need to be aware of this, uh, specifically nowadays, where more and more people and groups are using these, uh, these methods. So conventional statistical analysis of your data, uh, example comparison of means, and machine learning classification, such as out of sample generalization, are two conceptually different approaches. Um, and I think 
this I, I hope this is this is at least one message that you will take home from from this presentation uh, or at least be uh, intrigued to dig into this a bit more and see how it applies to your own research so if you go back to the question we asked before is hypothesis driven research over again i will say let's go back come back to this question a little bit later but maybe a small hint it might depend on how we define what is a hypothesis um so for the um, the empirical data I wanted to share with you um, today, um, I'll first go through an uh, I chose an EEG study where we look at um, uh, dreamers or dream recall, the ability of people to remember their dreams and how does that impact the EEG during sleep. Um, an intracranial EEG study where we look at free choice, our ability to to make a free choice, and what what are the neural correlates of that um, based on intracranial recordings. Um, and finally, a MEG, a MEG study where uh, we, we uh, had data in uh, schizophrenia uh, patients and compared those to controls. So before I can give you more details of these studies, I'm going to go very briefly over just two or three slides, some basic concepts on oscillations, uh, as some of you might not be familiar with, with brain oscillations. So these are probably one of the very first brain feature, features of brain signals ever recorded, even though it took time for us to get back to analyzing them with spectral analysis techniques such as Fourier transform. But actually, if you go back to the very first recording of EEG signals non-invasively by Hans Berger in 29, basically the first observations ever of brain activity were uh, showed these rhythmic activations that you can see here, these periodic activations in different frequencies. Um, and they change um, depending on our behavior. In particular, um, you see here, if you're in a relaxed state um, or uh, drowsy or asleep or excited, you see that there are changes in the amplitude and the frequency of these, um, of these rhythmic activations of the brain. The, the rhythm that most of, you, most of you are probably familiar with is the alpha rhythm. That's about 10 oscillations per second. And that's typically also a rhythm or um, those are oscillations that increase, increase in amplitude when you're getting drowsy um, compared to when you're alert and um, excited. So how do we measure those, uh, those oscillations? Typically, it's as if you were bringing down a microphone onto a stadium. And if you can imagine that all these people in the, in the, in the audience or in the stadium, each one of them represents one neuron, uh, what you're doing with the microphone is you're rec recording an aggregate of the noise made by these uh, individuals in the audience. So if they are clapping um, randomly, then you just hear some, some sort, sort form of white noise. But if they are clapping in a specific rhythm because they're at the end of the game and they're encouraging the team and they start to, to clap um, in a synchronized manner, that's when this microphone will also be picking up a pattern in the data. And that's typically what we're doing with the EEG electrodes or the MEG uh, sensors. So, Recording the population activity with EEG and MEG is basically like holding a microphone over a stadium, but we have many microphones because we have many electrodes or many sensors in, in MEG. And you can't really tell what just one individual is doing, but you can get an idea of what's going on. If you have massive synchronization in the, in the activity of the, of, the, of the neurons, then you'll be able to see a pattern um, that you can measure uh, at a distance using MEG or, or EEG. Um, I promise to be brief on this uh, on this crash course on oscillations. So just to tell you, there are very fast oscillations that can go up to even 600 hertz, what we call the fast ripples, and they are very useful when looking at epilepsy, for instance, have, has been shown in, in a number of studies. Uh, we refer to these as HFOs, high frequency oscillations. Fast gamma is technically between 90 and 150 hertz, and um, gamma rhythm is between 30 and 90. Uh, if we look at the other end of the spectrum, in very slow oscillations also uh, are detected in the brain. Uh, the delta range is like one to four hertz, but there are also slower oscillations that have been reported that can go really, really slow down to ultra DN. Uh, so overall, this just gives you an overview of the different frequencies and the nomenclature that go with them. Um, as I said, one of the most well-known ones are the alpha and the beta rhythms uh, that have been uh, reported extensively in, uh, in EEG and, and MEG data. Um, these can be measured with a number of tools from spectral analysis. We look at the frequency. Uh, every oscill oscillation has a frequency, phase, and amplitude that we can ass assess using uh, power spectral density metrics, time frequency analysis, wavelets, Hilbert transform, and I'd be happy to discuss um, if there are students um, interested or that are using these techniques and have any questions. So 
With this, I go straight to the, to the EEG study of dream recall. Um, the question we ask here is, what are, the, are there any links between brain oscillations as measured during sleep and uh, the ability of individuals to remember their dreams? Um, and as uh, many of you might know, within sleep, there are several specific, specific stages, stage N1, N2, and N3, and REM sleep. Um, and the, the cycle repeats a number of times uh, during the night. Um, and so before we go into our uh, own data, uh, one, uh, the question that we can ask is, what do we know about the neural correlates of dreaming from the literature? And so this is a study published in 2017 um, that has shown that, um, well, even though traditionally dreams, everybody believes that they happen in REM sleep only, it has been shown that we do also dream, maybe not so often, but also can, uh, dreams can also occur during non-REM uh, sleep. Um, and in the study here in 2017, the participants were awakened randomly throughout the night and were asked whether they were just, uh, whether they were dreaming just before being woken up. Um, and if so, then those seconds before were used as uh, windows where we know the subjects were dreaming, because that's the trickle, the, the tricky part of studying dreams uh, <coughs> or the neural correlates of dreams is that you never, it's really tough to tell whether somebody was dreaming or not. So one approach uh, slightly invasive is actually waking people up um, and asking them whether they were in the middle of a dream or not. And so by doing this, this team were able to look at uh, oscillations in different frequency bands, comparing, uh, so DE and NE stands for dreaming experience or no experience. Um, and so you can tell here that there were, they, they found increases in, um, um, in um, during non-REM sleep uh, in the delta range here. Um, for, uh, for um, the, well, it was weaker in the dream experience than in the uh, no experience. Um, and you can see the same thing happening in, in, the, in the REM sleep here. So there are modulations of delta activity. One interesting thing that the study also showed is that in dreams where the participants mentioned having seen faces, um, the data an analyzed during, um, um, during, well, during the, the, those dreams, showed um, activity in the fusiform face area, which indicates probably that um, this is, as we know, this is the area that uh, lights up also when individuals see faces in real life. Uh, so it's interesting to see that on dreams that report um, uh, or include faces, that this activity also occurs. Um, our question was slightly different. It's more about dream recall. So, um, Instead of waking people up, we actually, um, in collaboration, um, I'm going to skip to this, in collaboration with, um, with um, a team in Lyon, uh, we were able to collect data from participants who say that they um, dream a lot compared to participants who they say they never remember their dreams. Um, and so uh, this was a nice collaboration with Perrine Ruby um, and involved a lot of work by um, Anirou de Kemtour. Um, Arthur Degan from the lab and Tarek Lezhnev, uh, Jean-Baptiste Eichenlaub and Arna Gosch. So how do we define high dream recallers and low dream recallers? High dream recallers are people who remember or claim that they remember their dreams more than three mornings per week in a survey. Um, those that are low recallers say that they remember their dreams less than two mornings per month. Um, so um, after running this in over 1000 participants, um, 36 were invited to the lab to spend the night with uh, EEG recordings and sleep in the lab. And so we had 18 in each group. Um, and those are just some technical details. So now what I'm gonna show you now is, is a study where we tried to classify high dream recallers versus low dream recallers based on EEG data using handcrafted features and um, LDA. So, <coughs> Why would one want to do this with this approach? Again, keeping in mind our, our broader question of using machine learning versus statistical approaches. Here, the idea was to say, well, um, if I can train a model using the EEG data and a number of features that we extract from the data, and then we can look at what, uh, whether the model is successful in discriminating individuals that are individuals that have high dream recall versus those who are low dream recallers, when that happens, you will want to see what were the features that allowed that discrimination to occur. So by doing so, it's as if you're opening the box and saying, instead of saying the hypothesis, I think it will, have, it will be in the beta range, or my hypothesis is that beta oscillations differentiate these two, you say, well, I'm going to give my algorithm all the frequency bands. 
And then we're going to look at the decoding accuracy that each of those features provide or lead to across the whole brain. Um, and then you look at that as your new source of information and you try to make some interpretations based on that. So long story short, we used uh, several um, handcrafted features, specifically spectral power, but also um, uh, co-spectral matrices uh, and time covariance matrices. Um, and what you see here are the results uh, for three frequency bands, beta, sigma, and alpha. And just for your information, sigma is between 12 and 16 hertz, and it's the frequency range of spindles, for those of you who are familiar with, with, with sleep research. Um, and so we had also an alpha range, which is the more classical alpha right, between 8 and 12. Um, and the first two columns show the, the distribution of power for the high dream recallers, the first column. The second um, is uh, for the low dream recallers. And then you can do statistical analysis using, for example, corrected t-test values, t-values. And on the left, on the right, uh, you see here the results using a decoding um, algorithm. I think if this is an SVM or an LDA, and it identifies areas with uh, significant differences between the two groups. And so, the, what this tells us is that activity in alpha, but specifically, even more importantly, in sigma, seems. This is again in. I didn't mention this, but the top you see this is in sleep stage S two or N two. Um, so it's activity in the sigma that provides the best classification or the best discrimination between individuals who remember and those who don't remember. So basically, uh, the take home message from here is that activity in the spindle range um, during uh, S2 sleep stage is a powerful disc discriminator between these two, group these two uh, groups. And so it is probably involved. Now, is it involved actually in the dreams themselves, uh, the process <laughs> of dreaming or in the ability to recall so more related to memory, um, that is a, a separate question. There's a little bit of noise behind me, so I, I hope you can still hear me well, this uh, the working on the effort of this next door. Um, so we did now the same type of analysis using a slightly different approach, still using machine learning, but now we're using um, a CNN, a convolutional neural network, on the same data. And with the important difference here that instead of uh, doing um, um, handcrafted, using handcrafted features that we compute because we think they are probably of value, we just basically give all the raw data to the classifier. So the, the CNN now takes in, as you can see here, um, channels by time. So we give the raw data um, to, uh, to, the, to the classifier and we use uh, convolutional layers uh, one dimensions uh, in, in the in the um, in the x so across time and one dimension across uh, channels, um, and then we have a classifier at the end, and uh, which basically we train this neural network to identify uh, dreamers and non-dreamers, um, compared to a uh, let's say a vanilla approach or a logistic regression model. We see that we get better decoding, uh, and we can look at the decoding accuracies that we get across the different sleep stages. Also in awake, so this is before they fall asleep, uh, steep stages S1, S2, deep sleep, and, and REM. Uh, so the first message here is that the, the algorithm or the, the convolutional neural network uh, is able to discriminate between the two uh, individuals. But one question here arises as well, okay, well, that's great, but you know, how, did, how did that happen? Um, and this is a critique that we often hear for deep learning uh, and it has been <laughs> often said that it's more of like of a black box approach where it works, but then what do you do with the information? Um, this is using um, a TSNE uh, visualization uh, procedure just to show how the, the dots, so the dots blue and yellow are the two groups, high and low dreamers. And you can see how the, the distribution of these dots evolve uh, before and after training of the uh, the artificial neural network. And so you see that at the end, after it's trained, you have a nice separation between the blue and the yellow dots. Um, what Annie Rood uh, uh, also did to, and Annie Rood is the, um, the master student who worked on the, on the analysis. Um, what he also did here is to see, um, trained, he also trained the algorithm on identifying individuals. Um, in other words, we wanted to make sure that whether are we identifying dreamers and high dreamer, high dream recallers and low dream recallers, basically because the algorithm is so powerful that it identifies individuals per se, and it's not actually identifying the ability uh, to recall uh, the dreams or not. Um, that turned out not to be the case because um, you can see here if you spread these 
um, across, if you use the subjects labels instead of the dreamer labels and you uh, train the classifier, you can see that we have a, a separate separation. Um, I, I can get back to this later, but um, we can discuss this further if you want. Um, I mentioned the black box. So one thing that you can do with these with these deep learning approaches is that you can also use an approach called a guided back propagation, where you can identify the segments that the um, the network uh, finds to be most discriminant and gives the highest probability of decoding uh, or classifying correctly the um, the data segments. Um, and then you can take those um, take those weights um, and apply spectral analysis on those. So instead of applying spectral analysis from the get-go and saying, these are my features, you actually let the algorithm um, learn from the raw data. And then you open the box and you try to, um, to explore the spectral and, um, properties of the most discriminant segments. And this is what you see here. And interestingly enough, you see that again, uh, in, the sigma, uh, in the sigma range, um, both in S2 and in deep sleep, there is nice um, classification and um, between these two conditions. So this somehow takes us back to what we were able to see by using these handcrafted features. So it's um, one might say, well, this is not so exciting if we can, you know, it's the same thing happened before. But this is, I think, really important to to figure out. It gives us more confidence in what these networks are doing if we are able to uh, afterwards open the open the, the box and find information that makes sense and that is coherent um, with other types of analysis. Um, so to wrap up this part very quickly, combining EEG and machine learning can identify brain features um, that can distinguish um, high and low dream recallers. Um, the use of artificial neural networks can bring in new data-driven insights. Um, and we find, found basically that uh, sigma is the most, uh, oscillations in the sigma range are the most uh, prominent for the, uh, for, the, uh, for the discrimination. I'm just gonna make sure, okay, I still have some time. So um, I'm gonna go very briefly over this intracranial EEG uh, study, but we can come back to it later and, and discuss in more detail um, if you're interested. So um, again, this is a study um, led by, um, well, now I can say doctor because uh, Thomas has uh, got, his, got his PhD a couple of weeks ago. Um, so Dr. Thomas Thierry um, in the lab. Um, and here it's based on uh, intracranial EEG recorded in a during uh, while uh, epilepsy uh, patients, so um, pharmacologically resistant epilepsy patients or drug resistant epilepsy patients um, had electrodes um, um, in their brain during the, uh, during the monitoring phase and took part in an experiment where uh, it was about uh, making a decision or following an instructed uh, rule. So I'll explain the task um, very briefly, but just for those of you who are not familiar and just heard me say that there are electrodes inside the brain. Uh, so this happens only rarely in very, um, uh, in very strict conditions. These are patients who, are, uh, who have drug-resistant epilepsy and who undergo surgery to remove uh, a part of the brain that causes the epileptic seizures. Um, and so what, what happens is they come into the hospital um, and they undergo um, an evaluation process where electrodes um, are implanted in the brain. There are several types of electrodes. ECOG is one of them, uh, stereotactic EEG is another. The electrodes are implanted in the brain. And what, what, um, what happens is over the course of about a week or 10 days, uh, the, the medical staff hopes that the patient will have the maximum number of seizures while the uh, electrodes are implanted in the brain because this will allow then the medical staff to identify where the, the, the seizures start. And that's an important indication on um, maybe how what brain area or what small tissue could be re rejected or removed um, to stop the occurrence of these um, seizures. Um, <clears throat> so in this context, uh, we sometimes have the chance to uh, record uh, brain data from participants with these in implanted electrodes. And in the task here, it's a free choice task. So there were mainly three conditions. So in, in panel A, what you see here, um, either we have either the free instructed or control. In the, um, in the free condition, a diamond appears and then instruct telling the the the, uh, the participant that um, on the second queue uh, he or she will be able to um, to do a saccade so an eye movement shifting the gaze either towards the right target or a left target but it's up to the participant to choose so that's the free choice condition 
um, if an arrow comes up left or right, that means that that's the direction to, to which um, the eye movement um, will, um, should occur. So that's an instructed case. So there's no free choice. And if a square comes up, it means no information is provided. That's the control condition. And then after a variable um, a delay period, then the arrow comes up all of a sudden and the, the participant cannot prepare it beforehand and will just execute that eye movement. So these are the three conditions. Um, what you see here, the images just show a distribution of the, uh, of the position of the electrodes um, across all uh, six uh, implanted patients here. Um, and um, typically, these are just two examples of, of sites, recording sites, one in the FEF, the frontal eye field, that is involved um, in controlling eye movements, obviously, and the IPS, the intraparietal sulcus. Um, the, what you see are time frequency maps on the left, showing that you see this, um, you have this, the yellow indicates an increase in uh, power, so it's a relative increase in power, and you see it happens in the higher frequencies. In the FEF, it happens specifically when the eyes move, so on the Q2, not on the Q1, because in Q1 there's no, no movement. Uh, but in IPS, we see these yellow blobs actually appear on, from the onset of Q1, and they seem to have different dynamics across the three different conditions, whether it's a control condition, an instructed saccade, or a free choice. Um, if you focus only on the gamma and look at the single trials, so the trial by trial, because as you probably know, the time frequency maps are obtained on a single trial and then they average. So what you see on the left-hand side, those are average maps of the distribution of power across the frequency and across time. What you see on the right-hand side, however, those are single trials, um, either, um, and you can see they're either average on Q1, they start, they, they're locked onto Q1 or Q2. Again, Q2 is the go signal where the movement, the eye movements occur. Q1 is when the instruction is given and where the, the stimulus comes on. And um, what you can see here, I'll draw your attention maybe to the very bottom um, panel the, on the right-hand side for Q1. That's basically where you see for the individual trials that the gamma power activity lasts longer in the condition where the individual is deliberating and making a free choice or a free decision on where to move um, their eyes when the second cue comes on and says go. Whereas in the instructed one, there is a brief gamma burst and that's it. And there's a weaker gamma activity in the, in the case of a control condition where no information is provided. Um, <coughs> and there are many more things in the paper, but just to link this to our talk today, um, we looked at the envelope of gamma activity across these different conditions over time. Um, and then we, we gave those as a feature to a classifier, um, a linear discriminant analysis, so very, a, a linear uh, classifier, straightforward, um, to see um, um, the decoding accuracy and how it evolves over time. So by doing so, we look at our ability to discriminate both conditions, for example, instructed versus control or free versus control. Um, but more specifically, we want to look at the decoding accuracy and how it changes and how it evolves over time. Where does it peak? In other words, at what moment do we have maximum separability of these conditions based on the, the, the decoding accuracy of the, of, of the algorithm? So that's what you see on the, on the left-hand side with those figures. Um, in all the panels, um, E, F, and G, H are the decoding accuracies that, that, you, can, that you can see there. Um, but one other thing that I think is, is really interesting, um, a, a technique that we can borrow or we can use from machine learning when we apply this to, our, to, uh, to brain imaging data or ele electrophysiological data in particular, is what we call temporal generalization or temporal cross-generalization. And that's, those are the maps you see on the right-hand side with those um, bright green and, and red colors. So what that is, is that you can see on the y-axis, that's training time. And on the x-axis, that's testing time. So in other words, you can train a model to uh, discriminate between two conditions, say the free choice and the control condition. Now, once you've trained that model, as I explained before for supervised learning, normally what you do, you would test it on data from the same time point, but not seen by the model to see how well it generalizes. And that's what we've, we've done it for, for the rest of, for the other figures. But here we're doing something slightly different. Once you've trained that model, you can freeze it and then use it on data that happens elsewhere in time to see whether the same model that is able to differentiate between 
um, two cognitive conditions or two cognitive tasks uh, or two processes, um, whether that same model is capable of of also discriminating over a longer period of time or elsewhere uh, during the experiment. So this gives us uh, a way to tap into the temporal dynamics um, of these processes. In other words, if something works at a, uh, a given time t, but it also works at t plus one second, probably an indicator that the same process also occurs once again at t plus one second. If we see as on the top right image there, that big red square, that means that there is a sustained process that is um, sustained over time and that, and that um, um, allows for this classification. Um, so you can train on time one and then that same algorithm model will still be able to discriminate over, um, over one or two seconds uh, longer, which is a reflection of a sustained process in the brain. Okay, so to summarize uh, the second study, uh, this was the first direct electrophysiological evidence in humans um, for the role of sustained uh, high frequency neural activation in uh, frontal parietal cortex uh, in mediating the intrinsically driven process of freely choosing among competing behavioral alternatives. Um, and for the sake of our talk today, um, the idea was to show that uh, machine learning based techniques um, such as just the, uh, just the straightforward classifier or the temporal generalization uh, allow, allows us um, to get some insights into the, the specific temporal dynamics of, of the underlying processes, which, which I think is quite useful. Um, I'm going to rush through the last part. Um, this is now work by, uh, sorry, by um, Golnush Alamian, also a doctor now. She defended her PhD in, in December. Um, and this was a collaboration with uh, Chris Singh's group, uh, Kubrick Cardiff University in Wales. Um, and so this is, um, I think many of you are already familiar with the importance um, and the impact of schizophrenia in our societies with over 21 million people suffering from psychotic illnesses. Uh, this is an old, uh, this is I think 2016. So um, um, progress in understanding the pathophysiological mechanisms um, is still slow. Um, one um, technique that we believe can bring new insights um, and complementary uh, information to other methods such as fMRI or structural MRI or EEG is the use of magnetoencephalography. And we are lucky to have an MEG system at the University of Montreal, just a, a, few, uh, a few meters away from, from, my, from my office. Um, so the next data we had access to here in collaboration with, with Cardiff was 25 schizophrenia patients, 25 controls, uh, we had five minutes of eyes open, five minutes of eyes closed. So this is a resting state um, experiment. Um, we used a number of, um, of features and again, used a machine learning algorithm to try and classify and see the, the, the ability of these features to discriminate between controls and patients. <clears throat> Among other things, um, Gonouche used uh, multifractal coefficients, C1, C2s that I get back to very briefly afterwards, but I don't have much time for, for details. Uh, we used a number of, 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 um, of other methods, but the one I'll talk a little bit more about is detrended fluctuation analysis, uh, which is a, a tool, uh, an approach that allows us to measure long range temporal correlations. So um, while you're looking at this image, um, I just need to explain very br briefly what LRTC um, is. So LRTC stands for long range temporal correlation. The DFA method is what we used to compute it. Now, what is temporal correlation. Basically, instead of looking at correlation or connectivity between brain areas, which you can also do is you can look at within time, across time, so for the same signal, you look at the um, correlation uh, multiple scales over time. One other way to, um, to look at this is to see this as memory in the system. If you have correlation that <laughs> extends uh, a long time through the, the time series, um, this means there's, there's more memory in the signal. Um, one, one way I like to describe this is, is as if you're comparing, let's say, jelly and jam, right? Im imagine that you're, that you're poking your finger into jelly or into jam. In one case, you just have a quick change and it adapts, that's jam. Whereas jelly, you might have movements of the jelly that will, will persist uh, several seconds after you've touched it. So in one case, you have a system that, ha that has memory, and this is basically sustained um, information that goes through time. Uh, and in the other, the other case, you don't. <laughs> so now if you use LRTC and run uh, a decoder 
on the data across the, um, the 50 participants, half of whom um, had um, schizophrenia and half were control. This allows us to identify after some statistical analysis, the areas that show significant decoding accuracy in the brain, uh, which you see here. And this is LRTC computed on the beta oscillations. Um, there's a lot more in the study, and so I encourage you to, uh, to look for the, the paper. It's published in Neuroimage Clinical in 2020 and shows also the same analysis and links also with, um, uh, with symptoms, positive and negative symptoms, uh, using the same measure. Um, so the take home message from that was that combining MEG source reconstruction and machine learning um, revealed the spatial distribution of long range temporal correlation decreases in schizophrenia. They drop compared to controls. So as if there's less memory in, in the signal. Um, the information is therefore probably not well maintained in the resting state neuro neuromagnetic signal. Um, and um, I think these results could, could help identify new candidate biomarkers for early schizophrenia diagnosis. And, and um, this has been a, a huge project um, and um, Golnush did a, uh, an amazing job um, uh, completing this. And she also, uh, this is the sequel to the same study um, that just came out a couple of days ago, um, again, by, uh, by Golnush, uh, part of her PhD work. Uh, where here uh, Gonush looked at the um, criticality and the data using um, uh, criticality, self-similarity, and multifractality measures. Um, and I don't have time to discuss this, but I, I encourage those of you who are interested in this to, to take a look at the at the, the paper. So I'm wrapping up now, need to finish. So uh, if we get back to our question about the hypothesis-driven versus research. Um, whether res hypothesis research is uh, driven research is over or not. Um, I think, um, so if we were live in person, I would ask some of you to just share their thoughts on this question, but maybe we can do that afterwards. But from my perspective, I think I hope at least with the data that I'll show you also today uh, to show that these are complementary approaches. Um, and we are, there is no way that we can say today that we don't need hypothesis driven research anymore. First of all, if we do have domain knowledge, we would be silly not to use it. So we should uh, use domain knowledge even when we're using machine learning. And these things go into the, uh, the, uh, the machine learning pipeline that are hypotheses, because if you are creating uh, features that you wanna use, you are choosing those features. And so there are, even when you're choosing your algorithm for a machine learning approach, you have some idea of what, of why you're choosing one method over another or some features over another. So we're always using uh, hypothesis driven approaches. And I think uh, the, the uh, data driven approaches might help us expand the view and maybe look at features that maybe we would not have went for if uh, based on the literature, uh, they don't seem to be relevant, but they might turn out to, to be relevant. Um, with this, I'd like to thank the uh, sources of funding for our research, and I would like to thank you all for your attention, and I hope I didn't go too much over time. Great. That was fantastic, Dr. Shirby. Thank you so much. It's, yeah, very, very interesting talk, both based on the empirical data that you showed and, um, and giving a lot of, um, yeah, posing a lot of, of really relevant questions about uh, machine learning and, and hypothesis-driven research. Um, we can open the floor to questions now, if anybody's got any, um, yeah, uh, Dr. Zagami uh, has a question, go ahead. Hi, thanks a lot for the very interesting uh, talk. I have actually two or three questions, but they are kind of related. So uh, I've read the Danilo's and Tal's paper, but there is another paper that takes a different approach. The, Jonas Gording paper, which says, could a neuroscientist understand the microprocessor? Which coming from that background with the system identification, doing a white noise modeling, doing ramp modeling and stuff like that. I think what we are doing even between the two association versus prediction is still in neuroscience. We are going without a model in a sense. I wanted to see like, how do you differentiate that aspect that they are discussing versus the Tal versus uh, Danilo's approach to look at the data and the models? Uh, thank you so much, uh, Yashar. That's a, that's a great question. I, well, my, my first response to that is I think there might be certain subtleties that differ depending on what question we're trying to answer. So for example, in a lot of the, the, the work that also uh, Cording has been uh, 
looking into or publishing, there's always this idea of using um, artificial neural networks, for instance, as a model. So um, in other words, how can we maybe reverse engineer the brain as like, trying to understand the microprocessor? So basically, that's slightly different question from um, trying to extract to do some data mining. We have a specific data set like fMRI or, or MEG or EEG, uh, and you're pondering on whether you should go with a, uh, a classical statistical inference uh, framework or whether you could go with a, with a machine learning, uh, some form of maybe supervised learning approach. Um, but yeah, so, so I think it really depends on the question you're asking. And I think that's, that's, that's always true, but maybe I, it seems that- Give an example, sorry that I'm interrupting. Like for example, your study one, which is a very, in, in a study two, which is very interesting. You're looking at the FEF with the free instructed and the control. We have kind of a model for superior colliculus and how it gets the signal from the visual pathway and it ramps up. And in monkey recording, they see like the probability aspect, the value aspect, the right and left aspects. And maybe I was, I was wondering like, in the study before that, you looked at the discriminatory signals, where they come from, from your network, when you looked at the network and you saw that it corresponds with when you look at the associations. Whereas in this study, you, I think there is a possibility of look at the model base and see if you add the model and restrict the model with the machine learning, for example. Then the where in the place, where in the brain you are recording and how the downstream works, then it might change, for example, the graph that you were showing training, testing the time and temporal generalization. That, for example, I don't know the, the anatomy of FEF much. I worked more in the superior colliculus, but it might be that that discrimination changes where you are and how the downstream works and stuff like that. I was thinking a bit like that in, uh, and your data is very nice for that because you have all the signals from, like temporally and very accurately. Yeah, yeah. I mean, thank you for for pointing that out. I think there's that data is rich, and we should probably explore it with other uh, with another framework of machine learning, with with maybe more of a, like a model based type approach or um, an artificial neural network, like we did for the dreamer non dreamer data, um, and see what information we can we can harness from the latent representations and how they are similar potentially. Um, we could. You could even think of like training an algorithm on, on on solving a similar task and then looking at similarities between an artificial neural network and the data at different locations across the so i would say i agree that that data is super rich and they, we have a very nice uh, spatial temporal resolution and signal to noise ratio one caveat however that obviously is within the cranial recordings uh, you don't, in humans, you don't have so many participants that have uh, enough electrodes in the same areas. So our sampling, our spatial sampling is, is somewhat limited for, for those types of, of, uh, of approaches. And finally, one, this is like a small thing. I try to do association versus prediction, but a very simple task, age association with vertical thickness. And what we saw there, at least with linear models, because the sample is not that big and there are like a lot of correlation within the data, that the association goes higher as we try to smooth the data and remove information. Basically, we remove individual information and we get better association, but we cannot predict as well. Whereas as we in, like decrease the smoothing, we see like a lot more noise but it has a lot of individual differences in formation that increases the accuracy. So it might go in the same direction where you found in your study one. But then I, I was curious that you actually found the same regions that discriminate between them. Whereas if you add more and more, if it will increase your accuracy from other regions. There are other regions that for individual subjects can increase the accuracy and have they have generalizability. Whereas if you look at the population, you lose accuracy actually. Yes, yeah, that, that makes sense. I, I would say we did not find exactly the same. So in other words, there was an overlap. So the areas that, okay. we, that we implemented were using handcrafted features, uh, we were happy to see them emerge automatically from the guided back propagation of the CNNs. 
but there were also two other areas that that were that were also uh, discriminant um, in, in those images. Um, Thanks a lot again for all the studies. Thank you, Yasha. Great. Thanks, Dr. Jobi. Um, I think we maybe have time for one more very brief question. Um, and then afterwards, I, I think Dr. Jobi, you said you were able to, to stick around kind of briefly on Zoom afterwards if people, so yeah, if, if other people have questions or want a kind of more detailed discussion, um, you can stick around on the Zoom and Dr. Jobi will be able to, to answer a couple questions there. Um, so I guess last question then to uh, Dr. Devenny. Uh, thanks. Uh, so thank you for the interesting talks. I'm really, uh... I really uh, enjoyed the, the studies you presented. I wanted to kind of connect the, the two studies you presented versus your introductory material. You talk about leave one out cross-validation and various cross-validation techniques and holdouts and everything. And uh, I'm wondering how that relates to the, the machine learning and the, the predictions that you did in your studies, because those had fairly small sample sizes that I under, uh, from what I recall. So can you uh, discuss the limitations you have in that context? and what you did maybe to address those? Yeah, thanks Gabriel for the question. Um, so one, one workaround, so that's a, that's a good point. One workaround, um, the sample size issue is that in many of our studies um, in EEG or MEG, um, our sample size is not uniquely the number of participants. So we run, we compute our features on a trial by trial basis. So if you have 10 participants and you have um, 200 trials per participant, uh, that effectively gives us an N of 2000. Um, and then when we do the cross validation on that, to make sure we don't mix individuals, we would be excluding the full data of, uh, for example, if it's a leave one out, then you'd exclude the 200 trials of one subject. So then you're training on all the other subjects, but the dimension, because our features are, are on a trial by trial basis, that increases the sample size. I hope that addresses the question. So that's one, one way of, of, of dealing with this. I hope that makes sense. Thank you. Okay, all right. Thank you so much, Dr. Jerby, for, for the talk. And yeah, if anyone has has kind of further questions or things they want to, to follow up on, uh, can stick around briefly on, on the Zoom afterwards. But so yeah, I think that was a very, yeah. very insightful talk and a really nice um, addition to the series. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me.